Good evening, everyone, and a, a really very warm welcome to this event. Um, a particularly warm welcome to students, uh, to fellows, to colleagues from across the university, to alumni, and to special guests. I'm thrilled that Trinity Hall can host this event this evening in conjunction with the Cambridge Centre for Geopolitics. And it's a pleasure to introduce our two guest speakers this evening, uh, though they need no introduction. First of all, Dr. Claire Jackson uh, is the senior tutor at Trinity Hall, and she's also one of the world's leading historians of Stuart England. Claire went to Loretto School just outside Edinburgh. She read history at Sydney Sussex College before going to the University of Aberystwyth for her MPhil. She then returned to Cambridge and to Sydney Sussex to complete a PhD on royalist ideas in late 17th century Scotland and she was also a junior research fellow at Sydney Sussex. Claire then moved to Trinity Hall in 2000. She was the co-editor of the historical journal between 2004 and 2011. As you'll know, she presented a three-part television series called The Stuarts in 2014 for BBC Two, and a two-part sequel, The Stuarts in Exile in 2015, also for BBC Two. She's written a biography, Charles II, The Star King, uh, which was published by Penguin in 2016. Her new book and the subject of our event today is Devil Land, England Under Siege, 1588 to 1688, which was published late last year. It tells the story of Stuart England as seen through foreign eyes. As Claire writes in the book, the hodgepodge of external perspective is central to Devil Land's emphasis on the remarkable degree to which 17th century English history was determined. In Alexander Pope's phrase, by foreign hands, who saw recurrent and irresistible opportunities for interference, involvement, and even invasion. And it's a compelling narrative, wonderfully told, and one which provides a startlingly fresh perspective on the most turbulent century in English history. It is no wonder that it was chosen as a book of the year for 2021 in The Times, The New Statesman, The Telegraph, and The Times Literary Supplement. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Andrew Marr back to college. Andrew grew up in Perthshire and like Claire, went to school at Loretto. Uh, he came up in Trinity. Uh, he came up to Trinity Hall in 1977 to read for a BA in English. He went on to become a trainee journalist with the Scotsman, where he was subsequently general reporter, business reporter, and parliamentary correspondent. Andrew joined the startup team of the Independent as political correspondent in 1986. He's also been the political editor of The Economist and The Scotsman and chief commentator of The, Pen of the Independent and editor from 96 to 98. He was also a political, political columnist for The Observer and The Express from 98 to 2000. He worked as political editor of the BBC from 2000 to 2005. He's hosted Start, Start the Week from 2002 to the present and The Andrew Marr Show from 2005 to late last year. Andrew is an award-winning journalist and broadcaster. Uh, his documentary series include The History of Modern Britain, The Making of Modern Britain, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, Diamond Queen, and History of the World. He's the author of 12 books on subjects ranging across history, biography, political theory, fiction, and art. His most recent book is Elizabethans, How Modern Britain Was Forged, published in 2020. He's also an artist, and his first solo painting show opened in Liverpool in June in 2017. The second one in the Graham story room. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wonder if you'll join with me in welcoming both our guests this evening. Um, as I said, the event this evening is hosted in partnership with the Centre for Geopolitics. Uh, and it's a pleasure now to, to hand over to Brendan Sims, who's the Professor of the History of European International Relations. Uh, he's also the Director of the Centre for Geopolitics. Uh, and this is also an opportunity for me to say thank you to Brendan for everything he's done to help make this event possible. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. I'll be very brief. As Daniel says, I'm uh, the director of the Center for Geopolitics. We're based down the other end of um, uh, town uh, in Fitzwilliam House, just opposite the museum. Uh, it's great to see so many people here for an in-person event. It's not our first in-person event, but it's certainly our biggest, uh, and I'm sure it will be our most successful. Uh, we're really glad, um, pleased and honored to co-organize this event uh, with college. Uh, for two reasons, really. First of all, because we hope this will be the beginning of a beautiful friendship with Trinity Hall. And secondly, because this is exactly the kind of thing the Center for Geopolitics does. Uh, we specialize in deep dive uh, historical explorations of issues which may or may not have a current uh, bearing. Um, and I can't think of anything uh, more relevant, more pressing than the question of England, and I use that word uh, advisedly, uh, and uh, Europe. Um, now, I, I can't uh, reveal what you're uh, about to hear, uh, but I am absolutely certain uh, that we are in for a treat. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to it, uh, and I hand over with that to Andrew Marr. Brendan, thank you very much. <laughs> the way I just thought I'd structure this note is we're going to spend 20 minutes or maybe half an hour talking directly about the book and its themes, because this is an extraordinary book. Um, if you've read it, you know that already. If you haven't, shame on you. But, <laughs> but buy a copy, not least for the illustrations, which are glorious. Prose is pretty good, too. I oh, hasten thanks. to add. <laughs> <Hasten to add. laughs> um, but we'll talk about the book. It is an amazing book, and I think it's one of those perception-changing books of British history, which only come, on, come along uh, now and then, every few decades, and this is really one of the big ones. Um, and then, just because it's irresistible, we might turn to some contemporary parallels or not. And then there'll be plenty of time, I hope, 15 or 20 minutes for your questions as well. So that's how it's going to be. So, Claire, can I just start about the, the time scale of the book? Because it's bookended, really, by the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, famous event, and it ends with the Glorious Revolution. So just explain why you chose that particular mm, period sure. for Devil Land. Shall I start with the title, just in case anyone or, well, hasn't read it, and then I'll move to the... So, so the, the, title the title is a kind of Dutch smear. We talk a lot about smears these it's days. Here's a smears. Dutch one. So the title was coined by an anonymous Dutch pamphleteer in 1652. Uh, it played on a traditional pun whereby the English, the Angli, were often conceived as angelic, sort of ang angeli. By 1652, the English did not appear angelic. They looked like uh, fallen angels, diabolical devils. Three years earlier, they had put their divinely ordained king, Charles I, on public trial, executed him. That had sent shockwaves throughout continental Europe. And the replacement Republican regime seemed uh, defiant, unrepentant, and even worse, were about to declare war on the Dutch. So Deufelland was a, a Dutch smear. And, but it wasn't uncharacteristic of the levels of invective directed in England's way, and it is bookended by 1588 and 1688, and I can explain. Yeah. Well, well I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that, because you, you've taken us already into really interesting issues. So it's, this is England in particular, yeah. as seen by not just the Dutch, mm. um, but the Venetians, the, the French, uh, various German states, and above all the Spanish, and they've got their ambassadors. Mm. Um, and a lot of your book is based on diplomatic records, the ambassadorial letters mm -hmm. and so forth, and therefore we see very vividly how they saw us then. It's that line from Burns, isn't it? To see ourselves as others see yes. us, only it's in England. Yeah. Yes, it is that continental perspective. I think it's it's hard, It's a geopolitical book, which is why it's, it's nice to be doing this with the centre. I mean, it is a story of how a medium-sized state like England on the Con, sort of continent on the periphery of uh, Western Europe is viewed by what are then superpowers, Philip II, Spain, and then in the uh, later 17th century, Louis XIV, France. England has a relatively young Protestant church. And after 1603, not only does it have this alien imported dynasty, the Stuarts, but it also becomes part of a multiple monarchy. So it, it, it is also the perspective of how England is seen from Ireland and Scotland. You know, Ireland to the West has a majority Catholic population and looks like a tempting Spanish side door. Um, Scotland, England's long-standing enemy, uh, has long traditional links with France, cultural, commercial links, and always looks like a tempting backdoor. So the fears of some form of encirclement are really what drive a lot of the narrative. 
I wonder to what extent this is a, a kind of an attempt to demolish the Whig view of history, because I was brought up, like a lot of people of my age, I'm an advanced age, we both went to Loretto, and it was a boys' school when I was there, so you can draw your own conclusions. <laughs> um, I'm an advanced age. Um, and this Whig idea of history that, you know, there was uh, Tudor England, a nest of singing birds, lots of liberal ideas, a fair number of doublets, this and that, slight bit of <laughs> slight, slight moment of trouble around the Civil War, but wrong, but romantic, and et cetera. And then, ineluctably, inevitably, there's the glorious revolution, and we create this fantastic parliamentary democracy, which is so liberal and successful, we, we, we evolve the empire out of it, and, and history kind of moves ever forward in a kind of patriotic haze with a certain number of trumpets. And there's a very, very interesting phrase you use in the book, Claire, when you say that, in fact, during this crucial period of early modern history, England was seen as a failed state. Yeah, and that's the, that's the phrase that's been picked up by newspapers. Um, yes, um, it was, it, it's a self-consciously partisan and polemical book, and I think I, think I do make that clear. Um, it's deliberately partisan and polemical as a corrective, because yeah. um, I, to me, um, England in the 17th century is inherently unstable, volatile. I mean, certainly, and I deliberately wanted to see it through um, others' eyes because to them, you know, England is, its, its intentions are impossible to fathom. It's both sort of, you know, and we can move on to contemporary parallels if you wish, but it's both, it, it seems to have this sort of deluded sense of its own importance, but not matched by any real power behind it as well. And, you know, I mean, foreigners are alternatively, uh, alternately sort of um, infuriated, um, maddened, mystified. Um, and it's, it's both, it's both sort of very difficult. So I mean, many of them are Catholics as well. So it's also sort of you know, nest of heretics. Um, but it's also very open. So it's, uh, you know, it, it, it does offer that chance to meddle. Absolutely. And from their point of view, this mm. is very definitely not the obvious route to modernity, as it were. Modernity is about, is about autocracy and supremacy, whether we're talking about mm. the Spanish Empire mm. or the French. Um, there, there is a way forward for science and enlightenment, and it is absolutely not what the English are up to. Well, it, it's having the kind of infrastructure and the resources that you can deploy armies. Mm. Um, I mean, I have tried to pepper the book with, there's quite a lot of jokes. I mean, it's quite, mm. it's quite uh, you know, diplomats are, do, diplomats do make good copy. I'm sure they do mm. today, um, and they did in the 17th century. And um, there's a sort of satirical account of Jesuit, a Jesuit play that's staged in Antwerp in the 1620s, where they're talking about the lack of support coming for the, pro, the pro, uh, Protestant elector um, in Bohemia. And they're saying, oh, it's all right, help is coming from the Danes and the Hollanders and the English. And then a few minutes later, it's, oh, well, the Danes are going to send 100,000 herring, the Dutch will send 100,000 cheese, and England will send 100,000 ambassadors. Mm. Um, <laughs> it's just as though England, there is no way that they can deploy yeah. armies. All they can do is talk and talk and talk, um, spinning this spider's web, as they often describe it, of diplomacy. And this is obviously a period when, as it were, national image and power and stuff, very, very much centred in individual rulers. Yeah. So, so, so the state and the ruler are seen almost as the same thing. And going back to the book ending question, mm. so it starts with the execution mm. of Mary, Queen of Scots, seen right across the continent as an almost incomprehensibly bloody, heretical... Um, outrage. Uh, outrage. Mm. Well, and, it, and it ends with the Glorious Revolution. And you remind us, Battle of the Boyne, William is actually grazed by a cannonball. His skin is, is grazed by a cannonball. Had that cannonball just been slightly better fired, <laughs> history would have been extremely different. Everything all the way through is on a knife edge. Yeah. And I think that's the point. I mean, it's a geopolitical account, but it intersects the whole way through with dynastic history. Yeah. And I think dynastic history, the Stuarts, does remind you of precarity. I mean, the Stuarts only come to the throne because of what I call sort of Tudor biological bankruptcy. You know, the Henry VIII, no, no one works harder to secure the succession, it seems, but no one actually succeeds in getting it beyond their own children. Mm. So, um, but, so one of the big, big arguments in favor of James VI is that he comes with um, two sons and a daughter, but then everything changes again in 1612 when Prince Henry, the heir that he has cultivated, the person to whom the Silicon Door is written, Prince Henry dies unexpectedly of, of sort of typhoid. One thing I've also tried to do in this book as well is 
reintegrate the Palatine branch um, mm. into the story because that is the branch that comes from Henry, who dies in 1612, his older sister Elizabeth, Charles I's older, older sister. Um, I mean, it is from their line eventually that we, we acquired the Hanoverians. I mean, yes. uh, the, win the winter. The Winter Queen. The Winter King and Queen, yes. yes. And I think, you know, in a sense, the French are quite used to Prince Etrangère um, and sort of cadet branches, but we had exactly the same. I mean, the, mm. the Palatines for a long time were seen as, you know, much more secure in their Protestantism. Um, and just as the Civil War divided families in Britain, I mean, the Civil War actually divided the, the, the Palatines. Uh, the older son, Charles Louis, came over into Parliament and uh, during the Civil Wars and moved into Charles's, his, his his um, exile, his, his uh, Charles was out of London, moved into his apartments and took a subsidy from Parliament, while Prince Rupert and Prince Morris became sort of very prominent in the royalist cause. One of the things I really, really enjoyed in the book is the way you foreground both Ireland and Scotland. I mean, England is surrounded and is surrounded yeah. now. We'll get on to that later on, perhaps. <laughs> um, but at that point, very much surrounded. And Scotland um, comes out of this. I mean, they are seen as an unbelievably duplicitous um, group of people, the Scots, went Scott right, all the way, Scots. all the way, all the way through. L London is trying yeah. to work out what's really going yeah. on in Edinburgh, what's actually going on in James's court, what the real motives yeah. are, and finding it incredibly difficult. Well, James, I think that's actually why I like ambassadors because this is a world in which you don't get the face-to-face -face heads of state meeting very often. I mean, the fact that William and James are on that same battlefield in the Battle of the Boyne is, 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 is the exception. But we've so, all seen the film. I mean, Elizabeth yeah. and, and Mary, they do, do not meet. meet. They no. do. We've, it's in the film. It must have happened. <laughs> it's, it's just irresistible creative <laughs> temptation, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so, I mean, no, I think I think the, the one thing that James, I think, six is 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 blended at doing is playing both sides. Um, you know, the one thing he can do all those years that he's biding his time, wait, waiting, as, it, as all Europe is, for Elizabeth to die. Um, you know, he's the only one that can negotiate with other sovereigns on his own terms. And I think, you know, that's a real mistake, I think, in the English history that you and I were probably taught, yes. even in Edinburgh, was that James is always treated as a new king in 1603. And you think, well, no, he's been on the throne. He's crowned as a, as a very young child, but he's ruled Scotland for at least 20 years on his own. And the way he's maneuvered Scotland's interests is through ambassadors um, and you know he hosts something like over 250 delegations from over 30 states while he's king of England and he has a very very he's, oh, for a long time had a very bad rep I mean he, he was presented as this kind of lolling figure with his tongue too big I think for his mouth drooling um, incoherent um, witch burning a bit mad from your book he comes out as an extremely sophisticated very, very clever, indeed intellectual leader, and, and for a long time a highly successful one. I think he's the most intellectually, yeah, he's the most intelligent yeah. monarch that Britain has ever had. I mean, you know, then mm. since, um, he's, a, he's an amazing figure, um, I think, who, yeah, who understands the complexities of multiple monarchy, um, who is often out of sync with his, you know, after the gunpowder plot. I mean, again, these these events, the, the book is book ended by 1588 and 1688, but there are these sort of seismic events that we have almost normalized, things like the gunpowder mm. plot. And, you know, after the gunpowder plot's discovery, there's so much pressure for him to clamp down on, on Catholics and, you know, become the kind of um, persecuting monarch. Uh, but, you know, he is, he is very clear about wanting to sort of fracture that Catholic mm. threat into a, a radicalized mi minority and a loyalist majority. So, no, there are, there are lots of times when I think James gets a very unfairly mm. bad press. And in terms of our misapprehension, mm. misapprehensions, let's go back to the, the, the glorious revolution. <laughs> this is very much a Dutch invasion, a Dutch continental yeah. invasion. And in some parts of the book, you kind of compare it in a way to the Armada. Yes. Which we see, you know, the, the great liberation from the Armada. From the Spanish and continental point of view, this was a kind of mercy mission to rescue yeah. a people whose yeah. state was utterly chaotic and exceedingly dangerous. And the confessional thing is really important. I mean, if you go back to, say, just for a minute, then I'll get to the you go back to, say, the gunpowder plot. I mean, if you get into the, the minds of those plotters, mostly Midlands gentry in their 30s, I mean, part of their desperation is 
the sinking realization that James VI is not actually going to suddenly convert to Catholicism as everybody had hoped. Because you know, monarchs can also change their religion. Henry IV yeah. had done it in France. Paris was worth a mass. mass yes. um, and there've been so sort of covert hopes that James, you know, is the son of the martyred Mary Queen of Scots, his wife Anna of Denmark, good Lutheran to start, but had covertly converted Catholicism in the 1590s. A lot of Catholics thought maybe once he's king of England, you know, he might seek vengeance. And not only is he a staunch Calvinist, but he's got three sons and one of them's called Henry, the oldest one, and that's not good for Catholics. Um, so, you know, I think they sort of have kind of, you know, there's this prospect of a never-ending Protestant dynasty. And then if you fast forward to 1688, I mean, the, you know, it's a dynastic arrival that changes everything. I mean, most people have been prepared to put up with Charles II's younger brother and heir, James the Seventh of Scotland, second of England, as a sort of you know, and a, a hereditary Stop, yeah. necessity. Um, he was Catholic, but he was, if, if he only lasted as long as his brother into his 50s, he would only be around for you know several years. His two daughters by his first marriage to Anne Hyde were staunch Protestants. They later became Mary, as in William and Mary and Queen Anne. And then out of the blue, um, his second Italian wife um, produces a son. And then yeah. it's exactly that same prospect of a never-ending Catholic dynasty that focuses the mind. And yes, I mean, it, it is certainly organized as an invasion, and in mm. terms of its size and logistics, you know, it is it, 400 ships and it, it 10, lands. 10,000 troops. And, and, yeah, and the eschatological significance that, you know, it's not only 100 years after the Armada, but he lands in Torbay. Uh, in Devon on the 5th of November, which Protestants have already sort of incorporated into a calendar of Protestant deliverance. And people are sort of readily making these connections as well. And it's a lucky wind. It could easily not have happened. Well, the, not, yes, yeah. I mean, the wind. Oh, it's also mm. a lucky no, wind. It, it, was a lucky, it was lucky for them, wind. Yes. Uh, in, yeah. um, in other words, this was an invasion which might well have failed. You don't normally try and sail in that direction in November. Um, oh. And yes, it's, and again, there, there are, as you say, sort of so many what ifs. I mean, I think, you know, most people are expecting some pitched battle on English soil in Salisbury. Uh, and the numerical advantage would at that point still have been with James. James has uh, a nosebleed. <laughs> so the period also ends with a lot of shedding of blood. You've got Mary's blood at 1587, mm -hmm. and then you've got James's nosebleed 100 years later. <laughs> but James's nosebleed means that, you know, he, 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 um, he goes to London, and that, War that sort of that that pitch battle between the Williamites and the Jacobites is exported to Ireland and happens there. Yes, because the Battle of Aboy is one of those things well remembered in Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. notoriously of course, but almost forgotten here, and yet one of the absolutely crucial battles in British history, as we and you know, in continental it. history. I mean, I remember once <laughs> interviewing Tony Clayton about you know, what he thought about William's reasons for inter uh, for intervening in English politics, and I remember he said. Oh, there were three reasons. Uh, the first was Louis Fourteenth. the second was Louis Fourteenth, mm -hmm. and the third was Louis Fourteenth. I mean, mm -hmm. William is not intervening in some great Whig interest in constitutional politics. I mean, he wants to uphold his wife's right to um, succeed um, her crown, but I mean, he wants to harness England's resources, manpower, in a much larger war of which the Irish conflict is, is one theatre. Mm -hmm. And at that stage, again, we tend to sort of assume that that's the sort of end of it, but I mean, it's not clear which way that, that continental battle is going Absolutely. at that stage. Absolutely not. And Louis XIV's fleets yeah. are hovering around the Irish coast the whole yeah. time. There's sort of dim echoes of that in mm. James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, yes. in fact, yeah. Um, yeah. and I think in Ulysses as well. And, but again, forgotten mm. here. Um, just going back to the continental mm. side of this, the really, really powerful and potent foes are threefold, as far as I can mm. see. They're the, they're the Spanish. And we talked about the Armada being a kind of great uh, civilizing mission as far mm. as Spain is concerned, how we, don't, how we haven't seen it here. And there's the French. Mm -hmm. And let's just talk about, we talk a lot about Louis XIV, mm -hmm. the, the but Louis XIII mm -hmm. is a crucial figure mm -hmm. in this book himself. The whole, I mean, the French are related to, I mean, we also forget you know, how close the links are. I mean, the, you know, um, James's mother was, was related to mm. the Guise. Um, Henrietta Maria is related to the Bourbons. I mean, this is when you when I actually sort of tried probably one of my, my publisher Simon and I could have a discussion about the family trees. I mean, what I wanted was a family tree that sort of contextualized the Stuarts, mm. not only with their Palatine sort of branches, but also in terms of all of their relations with the Habsburgs and with the with mm. the um, with the, with the French Valois and the um, uh, the Guise as well. Um, yes, um, I mean and. So, England is often found, finding itself in this position of arbitrating between Spain and France as well. I mean, again, that's 
one of the ways in which there is diplomatic leverage yeah. um, and actually sometimes what might be seen as one of the themes of the book is the extent to which you can trust the Stuarts to act in England's national interest. And most of the time, the English conclude you can't because they're a foreign dynasty. But actually, they are remarkably good at, at, at playing both, both sides often. Now, this is obviously not a book of economic history, but it's important to say at the time that England is not particularly economically strong yeah. either. Yeah. It produces wool and pirates, so far as I can see, and that's about it. Yeah, and I mean, that is, that's one of James's gripes. I mean, yeah. you know, there is so much pressure for him to go and lead some international army to go and rescue his daughter, you know, whose, whose son-in-law he had advised not to take the crown in Bohemia. But, um, and then there's so much pressure about not only this dereliction of Protestant duty, but a dereliction of a father's duty. But every time he goes to the English House of Commons, the minute it comes to raising the kind of supply that you need to deploy those kind of armies, mm. there's a sort of quietness. And that's the transformation that happens right at the end of the century when, um, you know, William, William of Orange's priority is to raise, to, 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 you know, to create that kind of resource. Um, so deficit financing is introduced, the Bank of England is um, created, parliamentary sittings become regular. You know, that's the price for that kind of manpower. But it certainly doesn't exist uh, in the early part of the century. And, and the final big continental opposite, as it were, I suppose, is the low countries, yes. the Netherlands, whatever we call them. In many ways, a better run version of what England would like to be. It seems. I mean, you know, they've got a mm. bourse mm. in Amsterdam mm. before England mm. does. I can vividly remember visiting Antwerp and uh, being in a restaurant and the table next to us were overhearing our conversation. Chap leaned over and said, oh, can, can I ask her where you're from? And he said, we're, we're from British. I can tell you from British. Where, where, where in Britain? He said, oh, we're, we're from London. Short was, oh, we regard London as a suburb of Antwerp. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that kind of, you know, there's something in that yeah. as yeah. well. Um, so so they, were, they were more economically um, yeah. potent. Now, um, we said we'd come on to a few uh, contemporary parallels, just because they're completely irresistible. There's, there's lots about the Dutch lampooning of the English at the time. And I think only two days ago uh, on Twitter, there was a photograph of a Dutch cartoon oh, of Boris Johnson upside down with the clown's hat and his trousers falling down, uh, impaled on a tree. So on it goes. Um, do you think, he said cautiously, that <laughs> Devil, La Devil Land was a book of history whose publication was fortuitous in terms of timing. Oh, I couldn't possibly say. Um, it was contracted the week after the Brexit referendum, sort there of are, by yeah. chance. Yeah. And I finished it the week that we the, the transition period of whatever expired. Um, so there is a chronological coincidence. Um, I think it's fair to say that it was, it, it, I don't know, I mean, it wasn't intended as a comfort read, but perhaps it could be. I mean, you know, we have been here before. Yeah, and, really I mean, I remember that that week that I finished it. I mean, not any sort of relief and the sort of slightly, I mean, anyone who's finishing a PhD will sympathize that sort of slightly odd moment. Um, but I was, you know, also had a day job in the middle of a pandemic. And, you know, there was a sort of feeling at the end of December 2020 that um, I think at that point it was very unclear if there was going to be a sort of deal or no deal. There was a new variant that we were all sort of hearing about. We knew we were about to enter into lockdown. And I think at this point, then, I think the ferries just stopped. I think mm. France just closed its ports and you couldn't leave. And then there were sort of, you know, thousands of lorries stacked up at Manston. And I just sort of thought, this just doesn't feel very different. You know, this yeah. doesn't sort of... And I, I mean, at some point, I've also thought, it is a distorted account. I mean, I've, I've always sort of, you know, I've always thought it. I mean, I'm interested in that double perspective that ambassadors particularly have, because they're obviously calibrating what they're seeing in England in terms of their own country's interests. And, it, you know, one of the things I like doing at the end of every year is reading all those best political cartoons. It is mm. this. And I think you, you can tell a history through cartoons. And obviously, it's distorted and it's exaggerated and it's caricatured. But it's very real. Yes, yeah, yes. And I, you know, I've got lots of friends who are, as it were, continental mm. journalists, French or German, or whatever, and they're just enjoying shaking their heads and sucking <laughs> it so much. It's beginning to get on my. There is a lot of there is a lot of shaking. I think you know, there's the 17th century equivalent mm. of shaking of heads. Yes, a going, lot going on, um, and that's why I mean, I'm very interested in in sort of. Uh, rhythms of what's mm. in fashion and not in fashion mm. in history. When I was I, I was here as an undergraduate, um, sort of Victorian Edwardian history was hugely fashionable, mm. and that's what people were talking about, and, and uh, early 20th century history. And I just wonder whether we're going through a period in our own history which makes early modern history more attractive. It wasn't attractive then because we weren't doing terribly well then. 
and it seemed to be somehow yeah. less relevant. Now, I mean, this is very much a book about the different kingdoms, the three or three kingdoms, and we are slipping back, I think, to Britain of more than one uh, nation. I think it's. I, I think it, it's a complicated century, and it's not a century that I think has had the attention it deserves. I mean, if you compare it to, say, the, the place that the French Revolution or the American Revolution hold in their national cultures. I mean, we talk sometimes about the English Revolution, but we don't really sort of have that. And there still hasn't really been a good history. Well, it's been one, one or two histories, but mm. to my mind, not a really good and certainly not a popular history of the English Republic. No, no, no. Um, and... So, I, I mean, I would hope it was. I think um, in terms of themes of sort of contingency and precarity and complexity, I mean, it's a complex story. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to sort of take on board that, that complexity. I, don't, I mean, I've been sort of thinking, I mean, I've often thought if you want to know the history, know the historian. And I've always thought that, you know, actually you do remember intensely the things that were taking up place in the world around you while you were a student. Um, so, you know, today's generations of students will be, unless we go through this again and again, they will be the coronavirus generation. Um, and, you know, they will all be asked about that sort of thing. But, I mean, the one thing that I remember vividly from being here as a student in um in the early 90s. Well, I was, I was finishing my school uh, in 1989 and 1990, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and all this sort of discussion about the, you know, the sort of end of history and that mm. sort of Fukuyama debate. And then I, uh, here, I, I don't remember a lot happening domestically in the early 90s, but what the screen, what my TV screens were full of every night was the breakup of Yugoslavia. And, um, you know, I remember then being very struck by the casual way in which we didn't really think of Britain as a multinational state mm. with an uncertain constitutional future. And then watching night after night this unfold on Europe's doorstep had a really big impact on me, I think. I'm very, very struck. I mean, we were both educated in Edinburgh, but Edinburgh now and Edinburgh, yeah. even when we were both there at different times, very, very, very different, different place, very different city. And I wonder, you know, the extent to which um, particularly younger Scots yeah. really don't see themselves as part of the UK in any way at all. The news is different, the papers are different, the programmes are different, the culture is yeah. different. And they look down at Boris Johnson and who knows and next, just don't Liz Truss, and they just think, what's going on? We just yeah. don't get it at all. And we do appear to be moving back to a period where um, English nationalism is probably on the yeah. rise. I've just been reading form. Gavin Esler's How Britain Ends, where he, yeah. it's a very sort of reflective version of English nationalism. I mean, you and I, I mean, the big, the big hymn that the school that you and I went to was all about walking on England's green and pleasant hills. And, <laughs> yeah. um, and I remember coming from there to here yeah. and looking around and going, I don't see many hills. Um, yeah. But anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. but no, I think there's been a real cultural shift. I think, I mean, well, I didn't do any Scottish history in Scotland and I came here and it was English history and European history and there was no, <laughs> there didn't seem to be any role for England and Ireland in the history drive at that stage. But actually the one course that I did in my final year was was looking at the, 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 the makeup of uh, the new British history, looking at um, it was called the British problem. And then I think, you know, that sort of coincided with the years of my PhD were the years of the Northern Ireland peace process, devolution. I think, you know, I, I mean, it, it, it's obviously going to have an effect. And I think, you know, you can probably trace the trajectory of the sorts of well, questions I, I've been asking. I kind of feel we're not so far away from a border, Poland, Ireland, really. Mm -hmm. um, and so this suddenly feels, in its complexity, mm -hmm. to say, ever more relevant. Um, the other thing that feels to me surprisingly re relevant is this is a period when we talk about international politics and the personalities um, of individual leaders mm. as being more yes. or less the same thing or very, very closely connected. And after, you know, decades and decades and decades of reporting on British politics, as if it's really all about the system of rules, yeah. the balance of powers, the constitution, the mm. we seem to me to be in a period again when the foibles mm. of individual leaders mm. become absolutely central. And, you know, we stare at Johnson mm. and we stare at Macron mm. and that's what really matters. And perhaps we have been too sophisticated in a way in this country, in the way we think about politics and the crudity mm. in a way and the personality politics of your period yeah. are coming back. Well, I was struck. I mean, I remember um, talking to a colleague in, in Cambridge, David Runciman, about um, some of the books that were coming out about inside the White House, you know, mm. under Trump. And, and I sort of casually said, oh, I should go and read Anthony Weldon about James VI and first, it's no different. And I remember David phoning yeah. me, he goes, I don't, I don't normally take tips, but I did go and read it. And, yeah. and it was that sort of, you know, that kind of very tight court personality, you know, how you deal with unpredictable, yeah. uh, short term. You know, also sort of when, when you know that there's some sort of 
I don't know, sort of dissonance between yes. the, 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 the rhetoric that's coming out and, and realities. And I think all of these, that's what I mean, I think, I think it's a complex, a really complex story, um, the 17th century story. The private lives and personal feuds of Dominic Cummings and <laughs> Boris Johnson may actually dictate our history in very big ways. And that story, by the way, is clearly not over yet. Um, and that just, as I say, I go back and I think all this sort of constitutional history that I was taught, I was thinking about as being a serious political journalist, maybe much of it was just hooey. <laughs> uh, well, I think the precarity and the unpredictability, I mean, referenda are not something mm, that I, nope. you know, that one grew up with thinking that this is sort of the outcome. And I think unexpected fallout and how we sort of adjust to it. The other thing that I would, in fact, had more time, the other thing that I think is really interesting too is, is fitting literature. I mean, this is, the 17th century is the great era of literature. I mean, we're mm. lucky that we've got fantastic diarists like Pepys and uh, Evelyn and people to bring it alive. But I mean, one of the sort of funny things, funny, I mean, you know, there are walk-on parts for writers like Marvell, who are a diplomat and go to Russia, and Milton is a secretary for foreign tongues. I mean, I do, there is something about crisis that generates terrific literature. Yes, yes. And, you know, I'd be very interested to see how this period is written up in your, you know, that sense of how you live through very uncertain times is, is going to produce good literature, I hope. And not just the writers. I mean, Rubens is a great diplomat. Ru Rubens is a diplomat and gets the commission for the banqueting house sort of ceiling. It's, it's interesting, this book, talking about on the cultural side, how important art is in yes. terms of driving yeah. um, states to kind of know more about each other. And Charles's very famous visit down to loot uh, Italian painting. <laughs> yeah. By Italian painting. Span in Spain. In Spain, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, and I wanted to kind of integrate that because those are the sort of picaresque footnotes that you often think about the 17th century. What on earth were Prince Charles and Buckingham doing, sort of running off to Spain? And I once heard it about, you know, Chuck and Buck on tour or sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, it, it does lend itself to that sort of caricature, but it's, it's, it's jaw-dropping in its, in its audacity. I mean, you mm. don't, from a position of weakness, you know, James was trying to gloss it over, saying, well, I went to go and collect my wife from... Uh, Denmark and my grandfather went to France to collect his wife. Well, that was after the marriage treaty had been signed and the proxy marriages had happened. You know, to go and sort of negotiate a marriage treaty at the court of the most powerful empire in the world, um, you know, was 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 sort of audacious. And actually, one of the things I don't know if, if you noticed, one of the things that I thought was a sort of light motif through the book as well is is how literature can often operate as a safety valve. I mean. I do think they get obsessed with Don Quixote. You know, this sort mm. of, if, you, if it's all too much, the horrors of the Thirty Years' War, you can always just sort of refer to somebody as, oh, he turned up with his Sancho Panza. Oh, came in on his Rocinante. I mean, mm. it, it is hugely popular novel once it's translated into English, but I do get the feeling that, you know, sometimes that kind of comic literature can just be a safety valve for the horrors of the Thirty Years' War. As Twitter is today, and so all <laughs> bits of it are. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, that's, it's absolutely fascinating. It's, as I said, it's an absolutely beautiful book. Um, if there was a really brutal summary of its message, might it go something like, you English think that your comparative, long-standing power and uh, success and reputation in the world are down to wise decisions and national character. Wrong. It was just good luck. <laughs> Discuss. <laughs> Discuss. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what I got. I mean, there were, as you, you know, there's so many things that could have gone just the other way in this story. And yeah. so many moments at which the English themselves appear to be about to collapse completely mm. under foreign mm. pressure. And one thing or another, I mean, you, you might go back yeah. and say it was divine intervention, but as they thought at the mm. time. But again and again and again, it's a damned close run thing. Yes, and I mean, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that, you know, the thing that we celebrate 400 years later is something that didn't happen. I mean, gunpowder plot, you know, it would have been this massive catastrophe, but I guess it's a sort of government counter-terrorism success that it's discovered, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, there's a lot of what if. I mean, I guess it didn't go so well for Charles, the first one, people. Um, but um, I I'm not even sure that it would have been a diplomatic posting that I would have relished as a foreign <laughs> diplomat either. I mean, you know, uh, the climate was awful. It was expensive. It wasn't the most sophisticated city in London at the time, was it? No, no, it wasn't. But looking back, yes, maybe, maybe by maybe by 1700, you could have thought hmm, that was. Look, I mean, you, you look at some. I mean, people like Thomas Hobbes nearly live as long as the book. He's born in 1588, and he, he dies. Um, at 91, so he just about sort of spans it. But then he always said he and he and Thea were twins. And I think had you lived mm. through it, that would have been the, I don't, I'm not sure you'd have been thinking, blessed was I in this dawn to be alive. Um, I think, yeah. you know, I think you'd yeah. have been fearful. And I think that was, that was probably where the book was coming from. And in terms of culture, as well as political ideas, 
um, and ultimately governance. England is constantly learning from the continent, mm. hoovering up and importing, mm. sucking in yeah. continental ideas. Continental, something we didn't have. To news, like newspaper, that. news is a foreign yeah. input. News starts on the continent, and then the English, you know, love it, and, and mm. got successive governments try and stop it. But it's something that that, that um, continental observers notice how the English are. You know, sort of they have this itch after news, but it's a continental import first. Is there a part of the story that you think, I would really like to go deeper into that? Oh, no. And is it loads. 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 Okay. Um, I think in some I'm, ways... I'm, I'm edging towards asking you what the next book is, and I'm not really... <laughs> you know. No, there are lots. Um, so, um, yes, there are plenty of uh, potential PhD projects for students out there. Um, oh, I think there are, there are lots. I mean, one of the things I'm would like to do actually is, is think more about the literature um yeah. and, you know sort of really integrate some of the literature into that there are personalities in that story mm. that deserve re, re, revis yes. revisiting and rehabilitation there's yes. lots some of the cavalier poets actually are yeah. absolutely gripping yeah. into them. Yeah. Yeah. right um enough from us possibly i'm sure there's lots of questions so i'm just going to ask the gentleman here first of all and then i used to be an ambassador so. <laughs> 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 Uh, and I feel it was stuff about uh, you know, stuff about you know the scheming previous special mm. <laughs> Sorry. Terrific answer about this James Bond. Um, but you also quote, of course, so I hadn't realised it's contemporary. The point about uh, ambassadors being honest people yeah. sent abroad to write for their country. When I was an ambassador, it's a long time ago now. I used to think that about someone like decent, intelligent, honest colleague representing really unpleasant regimes. Mm. I mean, that was exactly. Mm. And I wonder whether you think that, you know, that's 20 years, 20 years later, when you think that British ambassadors are now honest people sent abroad to life their country, I mean, Brexit, uh, Cambridge policy, like, what do you think? I'm sure, there are, I'm sure there are people better qualified. I mean, the, 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 the comment you make is, is, is an interesting one because it was, it was uh, Henry Wooten, who was a serial ambassador or envoy in, in Venice, who unwisely perhaps wrote in the guest book that he was an honest man sent abroad to lie for his country. And he was trying to make the pun about lies in reside. And then it gets translated into Latin by Catholic polemicists who publish it to claim that really the English king is sending uh, people ab abroad to lie on his behalf. Um, so, sorry, the question was, do I think this is, do I, do I think that's really what they were doing? Uh, I think, so I know nothing about, them, not my period. Um, in, the, in the 17th century, I think what is interesting is that the, I mean, even the word diplomat is probably anachronistic now. I mean, there, there was no modern consular service. So I think the, the role of a diplomat is, is, is very much emerging at this point. The, the first sort of treaties of diplomatic practice begin to be um, published. And um, one of the phrases that, that comes around often is an honorable spy. So I think that is, I mean, you are meant to be there advancing your country's interests, sorting out prizes of impounded ships and acting on behalf of, you know, any of your citizens who find themselves, uh, you know, in trouble abroad. But you're really meant to be gathering intelligence and you're really meant to be sort of feeding that intelligence back because you are the, the you know, you are the literal personification and of the monarch in that country. And the Spanish... I should be very diplomatic. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think there is a great deal of truth in what you say. I think, I think of course, the role of ambassadors changed a yes. lot. The, you know, the Spanish ambassador, the French ambassador mm -hmm. in London in the 1620s or the mm -hmm. 1580s, very, very big, very well-known figures, aren't they? Yes. Powerful figures. Um, and I guess the other thing I, I would ask about is to what extent, because you've been pouring through all the, the mm. gripping correspondence, are they also trying to give um, Philip II or... Um, Louis the Thirteenth, the the stories they want to hear. Yes, there's a there is a, quite a lot of shaping. I mean, Elizabeth the First is famous for sort of you know getting Walsingham to write to, or, or having such sort of hissy fits in response to some of the reports that she's getting that Walsingham is referencing. Please, could you not just tell it exactly as it is? Please, you know, Her Majesty really didn't like that last thing that came in. You know, so I think, and that double perspective is is again what I what I find really interesting. I mean, in some cases, Elizabeth's ambassador in in Paris at the time of the Spanish Armada has decided that the only way he can tackle his mounting debts is to sell intelligence to Spain. So, um, you know, they, they some of them become double, triple agents as well. But the idea of them also being, I mean, I think what really makes a lot of English anxious too is when they see a foreign ambassador very close to the monarch. So I mean yeah. James is, is a classic one, the two Diegos, um, when he gets on very well with um, Gondomar, you know, they share 
wine wine drinking interests, book collecting interests, hunting interests. But you know, they become very close. And he's the one who sort of says, he, and James explodes and says, you know, the House of Commons is something that I found when I got here. I'm a stranger in this land, and I have to put up with what I can't yeah. get rid of. And you know, the fact that a, a so-called King of England is mouthing off to the Spanish ambassador about how awful his Parliament is. Um, <laughs> And then later, I mean, in a sort of much more almost insidious way, um, you know, the best way to get to Charles II is through his French mistresses. And, you know, the French um, ambassador has a kind of open door. And that becomes incredibly frustrating yeah. to English ministers who can't get anything like the access that, that France is <laughs> getting. Them. Um, mm. So, as I say, in these days when you don't have the summits, um, you don't have face to face. I mean, and, and they can become very bloody. I mean, all these arguments that we might think, oh, this is so sort of, you know, petty over precedence. I mean, if you actually take the ambassador as the, as the literal personification of your sovereign, it really does matter whose coach goes first. And, mm. you know, ambassadors get murdered and streets of London get bloodied over this sort of question. Mm. Claire, this is a fantastic sort of source of information you've come across and you've been working on. How easy was it to get hold of all this? Um, I mean, are they just sitting in archives in Venice, Paris and elsewhere? Or? There's a lot. I mean, one of the, one of the sort of, troop of people I, gave, I, do, I give credit to in the acknowledgements is um, phenomenal um, what's this, sort of cause of, of people who um, calendared them and transcribed them. I mean, I think, I, this may be more controversial, I think diplomatic history for a long while was, was quite siloed. So I yeah. think, you know, in the sort of, that diplomat you know, had quite, probably quite a narrow idea of what constituted diplomatic history, so what the sources would be put towards. And I think, I mean, there is something now called the new diplomatic history, um, which is much more about, actually, we do need to understand the th theatricality of what these people did. Um, so, you know, there is huge amounts of source material um, and you know, a huge amounts that, that um, that's what I mean, there's plenty of PhDs to come for, for lots of people. Ambassadors, you know, are under an obligation as well to write every week. I mean, you know, they, 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 they need to. Gentlemen, gentlemen here, and then Brendan. Thank you. Um, Andrew, you, you said in, in your presentation, um, England, uh, wool, piracy, but it was also food. Um, and that leads into um, my observation. Uh, I'm very much a Lasletian, if you know what I mean, very much influenced by um, the, the work of the late Peter Laslett, looking at, like, at the lives of quote-unquote ordinary people mm. um, as a counterpoint mm. to this um, attention given to mm -hmm. notable individuals. Now, clearly, most of your writer, I, sorry, I haven't read your book, I'm clear, um, is perhaps looking at the lives of notable individuals. But you must have also, because in this period you're covering, there's a tremendous transition in the lives of quote unquote ordinary people. The abolition of, of famine, perhaps being one of the most important ones. England never again suffered from famine. Um, do you have any observations uh, uh, about the transition that occurred to quote unquote ordinary people in, in this period? England didn't suffer from famine, Scotland did in uh, yeah, the 1690s. I, I that. <laughs> um, Yes, I mean, I th it's a very valid point and one that um, it stands. I mean, it, it, it's a different story. Um, it's, I mean, di diplomats could do not comment on things like, you know, the sort of regular running of poor relief, sort of different sort of things that go on in the courts. Um, it, it, it's, a different, it's a different story. I mean, it's, um, I still think the fear, I mean, the, the, if, if, you know, if you think about your, your, I'm imagining a sort of parish or a village, um, you might think, well, you know, why were they so worried about James the Seventh and the Second? I mean, you know, sort of just one Catholic monarch alone wasn't going to sort of change, um, you know, wouldn't. On the other hand, you know, James the Seventh and Second comes to the throne at the same point as Louis the Fourteenth revokes the Edict of Nantes. And if you're living anywhere in the south coast of England, you're getting waves of refugees arriving at every, you know, at every level of um, society with stories of forced conversions and, um, you know, what what a French army might do. So then, if you begin to think, well, maybe this king is is very close to Louis the Fourteenth, and there could be an event. You know, one's it doesn't take a great level to sort of scale that down. And I think, you know. I think we can use the word parochial wrongly. I mean, I think there is a huge amount. Yes, a lot of things happened at the parish level, but there are so many printed sermons that have exactly the sorts of themes that I'm talking about or people's notebooks. Mm. This, this imagery of a sort of eschatological 
um, you know, sort of great confessional struggle that is not yet over and in whose, whose destiny is being shaped by a few individuals, I still think is what you may well hear, even if your material if, comforts change. And if you're, if you're living in Cambridgeshire or anywhere mm -hmm. else, you are less likely to die of hunger and marginally less likely to die of disease. It's very, very marginal. But say the wrong thing yeah. and it can be lethal. I think that's the other thing we have to remember at this period. All those people fleeing to America or trying to get out uh, and parishes divided against and themselves. And exile is a, re a reality. I mean, a lot of people choose exile or, or go into exile yeah. as well. Yeah. Yes. Brendan, you're Thank you. It's a terrific book and it's been a great discussion. But can I just uh, push back on, on one thing you said, which was about uh, England's sort of deluded sense of self-importance. Um, mm. So it, you know, as an Irishman, I can say this. But isn't it the case that actually uh, what's restraining English people is this sense of unrealized potential? Mm -hmm. That if only they could get through the troubles, they would then have that voice in Europe which was they deserve. And if you think, you know, once Cromwell has prevailed, whatever you think mm. of Cromwell, he certainly cuts a very strong mm. figure mm. in Europe. Mm. You know, think of the Battle mm. of the Jews, mm. think of mm. capture of Dunkirk and so on. That really mm. makes a difference and mm. essentially finishes off Spain. Um, and then think of uh, the general view in Europe uh, confronted with Louis XIV. I mean, you mentioned William of Orange, but even long before that in the mm. 1670s, uh, continental pamphleteers are saying, when is England going to sort itself yeah. out and come to our aid? It's a famous one. Yeah. You, I think you quoted about, um, you know, uh, Europe a slave if England does not break its chains. Yes. Yeah. So in that sense, surely the English are not deluded. They are important. Well, they, something doesn't they, seem to be working. I mean, yes, matter. yes. Yeah. So, no, I, I think that's exactly why I think, you know, the, the, the diplomats, you know, the people that I'm looking at can't, can't write England. They don't, they, they, they don't want to write England off. It's also a very you know, curiously open society. I mean, they are sort of surprised that if they come uh, over to London, you know, the, 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 the boatmen that row them across the Thames will want to engage them in these kinds of discussions. So I think, I think, I think you're right that there is the, and, and you know, in a sense, that happens sort of later in, later in the 18th but, sort of century. But they need two things to happen before they can mm. be unleashed, surely. They need to end this sense of rival, hostile states on the same archipelago, mm -hmm. which they do in, which, in, this, in a very bloody way in this project. Mm. Um, and, and they also need to have a sense that um, this is a country which has a, a monarchy or a central government which lasts long enough to allow kind of some kind of, some kind of long-term planning and some national strategy. The French have had for a long time, the Spanish have had for a long time, but the English keep being frustrated. Or... And they need to sort out this dysfunctional relationship between monarch and parliament. I mean, you know, you have this situation in the late 17th century where I think they're probably exaggerated often, but nevertheless, Charles, the size of them but the, or the importance of them. But, I mean, Charles is taking subsidies secretly from the French monarch at the same time as MPs are voting to fight, you know, to declare war in France. And, you know, and, and the French you know, administration begin to realise that they actually have to now start paying pensions to the the opposition in Parliament as well to get monetised. You know, this is you know this is really perplexing to and, and frustrating to foreign you know, ministers because this relationship between Parliament and, and monarch is is so adversarial and uh, and unpredictable. Did you want to? Thank you, um, Suzanne Rain. I work with Brendan at Centre for Geopolitics. Um, as you were talking, the, I was reminded of a conversation I had with uh, a former Iraqi general. Uh, we were on an aeroplane flying out of Baghdad, and he looked at me and he said, why do we always kill our leaders? What is it mm. about my country? And the more I was listening to you talk then, I thought there's so many parallels, obviously, with, with, with you know, unrest in, in Europe and in Britain at the moment. but. That sense of um, confessional divide, of fearfulness, mm -hmm. of the complexity of choosing which side mm -hmm. you're on, and, and it being the sort of short-term bet versus mm -hmm. the long-term bet, if everything's mm -hmm. constantly changing, is something that in places like Iraq and obviously Afghanistan, it's it's now and it's present. And I'm, I suppose, I haven't actually got a precise question, but it strikes me that the story in your book about ourselves if we understand it and, and learn from it, ought to help us when we work out how we approach our understanding of what's happening in these countries that, that we say we want to help, but we don't really 
know how. Um, and that question of why do we always kill our leaders mm. um, is one which obviously we we don't feel that we have to ask of ourselves anymore. Um, but well. <laughs> should I stop there? So, hold, hold that. Hold that. <laughs> Um, so I suppose th there isn't really a question, yeah. but it'd be interesting to hear your, your views on that. Well, it's, it, it, I think what you're saying is it reinforces, there is always a tent, you know, hindsight is wonderful as a historian, one can sort of look back and you know, even things as simple, simple, you know, as the interregnum that we were talking about a moment ago. I mean, the very fact that we use those terms now makes it sound, you know, we've kind of made it safe. It's, it's obviously a sort of aberration. It's, you know, it's between monarchs. Well, obviously nobody was calling it the interregnum at the time. And, and one of the really interesting things that, that Brendan alluded to is the speed with which de facto, European powers sort of, you know, are, are pretty shocked and, you know, in a way there's a sense of deja vu with the regicide. It's kind of, oh, the English have done it again. Uh, you know, at least last time with Mary Queen of Scots, they did it, you know, the decency to do it behind closed doors in Northamptonshire. And this time they've sort of just done it in the middle of Whitehall in full view of everybody. Um, but, the, you know, there was shock and horror at the, at the, at the act, but then very quickly, you know, there are um, diplomatic delegations sent um, and, yeah, there are. There's a, a sort of standoff, really, between. Yeah, there's obviously between the exiled court, which is trying to sort of send its own ambassadors to sort of negotiate. So, yeah, I mean, it it would be very, very difficult to sort of choose which side and how long. So, I mean, maybe just, yeah, just you know, sort of sh um, taking away or sort of you know, sort of divesting ourselves of the sense that things go in a particular pattern. I think is really what the book was sort of trying to. Is there anybody else who'd like to join it? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, it's actually linking to the deluded sense of our own importance or England's sense of our own importance as a Welshman. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I was just going to probe a little bit why you thought that might have been, if it is the case in, in this period, in the sense that we can all understand now, even if it's misguided, that you know, we have our national myths about empire, about this, you know, we stood alone against Hitler and we won the Second World War. So we've got that to sort of fall back on as to why we're sort of really important, even though we no longer are. Um, but in the what? 17th century, what were they what were they thinking of? I think they were doing exactly the same. I mean, what is it? It's interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, um, that's quite a long time even before. Well, so. it's amazing. You know, what myths you want to tell. Um, so as I say, I've just been reading Gavin Esler's sort of Hybrid and Ends. He talks a lot about nostalgic pessimism as being a sort of uh, animus to English um, nationalism and uh, and a lot of these tr you know tropes that are sort of so from board. But one of the interesting, another sort of theme through Devilland is uh, your ghosts of, of, of you know glorious times past. So in the 1620s, you get I don't know what the collective town noun for ghosts is a sort of a veritable fright of ghosts. You know, sort of you've, you've got Elizabeth the First, you've got Henry the Eighth, Prince Henry, Queen Anna, all kind of hovering in printed dialogue, saying, "Oh, you know, uh, there was Kinsale." There were, I mean, any particular sort of time is is sort of revoked to say, you know, where are we at now? So I think you know the stories that we tell ourselves is is, is often what history you, is. You, you mentioned that the writers quite rightly this amazing writers, but part of that, of course, are the great growth of uh, antiquaries yes. um, and yeah. antiquarian interests and these stories about Merlin and the, 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 the builders of, of Stonehenge and the sense that somewhere back in this kind of misty, was it, was it, um, was it uh, Arthurian mm. or was it the Anglo-Saxons, mm. but there was a kind of original belief in liberty um, which starts to kind of percolate in all sorts of directions during in literature in this period, and presumably, therefore, and verbally as well. more likely, in an English sense, to sort of be stimulated by the uncertainty of the succession through the 1590s, and then this foreign monarch who, I mean, the English do well to solve the Tudor problem with a monarch, but they're right, you know, they get the, a, a, Pro a Protestant male monarch with three heirs is, is a good outcome, and no, no war. I mean, a lot mm. of continental Europe had just thought on Elizabeth's death that England would be plunged into a bloody war of succession. So they do quite well. But the minute James arrives, I mean, he seems intent on eradicating England as a country with this sort of great prospect of Britain. He seems utterly un, you know, it, uh, utterly unbothered by the idea that a greater Britain, you know, would, 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 would absorb uh, Scotland, England, world. And then he seems also intent on reversing decades of English foreign policy, which has been directed against Spain by immediately making peace with Spain. Um, and one of the things I do, I do do is sort of track through um, you know, the, the, the sort of gradual diminution of James's imagery. I mean, first it starts off as sort of the great sort of 
sort of language of marital concord. And, you know, by 1607, he's saying to the English Houses of Parliament, look, think of two snowballs, one snowball put together with another snowball makes a bigger snowball. And a, and a bigger snowball is better, you know, and the English are still saying, no, you know? Um, and it started off as, you know, I am the husband and the whole, you know, this is my wife and it was going to be some language of holy matrimony. And by the end of it, he's sort of And just to be up. clear to everybody, this is a period before Jacob Reef Smog is available to save us. <laughs> yes. yes. Anybody else? Sorry, I think there's one, one there. Sorry, yes. just, yeah. There's one there, sorry. Okay. Hello, yeah. On, on this um, <coughs> failed state idea, is there anywhere in Europe that doesn't, at some point yeah. in the 17th century, go through a terrible time? I mean, there's there's nothing in England that's as bad as a Thirty Years' War. Um, you know, France has terrible wars of religion. Spain, you know, goes bankrupt at the end of the period. I mean, Siege of is, 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 is England really an, an outlier yeah. in, in that sense? I think that's a very fair point. And <clears throat> whereas I think, I mean, as I say, it was meant as a polemical um, interjection more about the way we tell our British history. And I assumed that the backlash would become, we're not really a failed state, it was all, it was all wonderful. But actually, more often, it's exactly that point that's made that, I mean, you know, you wouldn't want to be anywhere in the central German territories through the Civil War. Uh, I mean, you know, even Venice is having a long-running sort of siege. The, 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 um, uh, uh, Catapulting bread across the marshes, as I recall. Um, you know, the whole of the um, United Provinces, the, the, you know, the Dutch United Provinces, nearly eviscerated by Louis XIV's army in its year of disaster. Um, so, yeah, where was, where was good to be in the 17th century? <laughs> um, the Portuguese having a decent time. It wasn't that great for people going to America either. Um, Portuguese, um, no, they were they were having a lot of their territories taken away. Um, no, I, it was a good. I'll, I'll, Sweden. I was wondering about Sweden, but even they then lose. Um, they lose. Um, I, I was thinking initially under sort of Gustavus Adolphus. That is sort of that he's sort of fulfilling the role that people are looking to James to fill. But then, then they get Queen Christina. Wrong, yeah, Queen Christina yeah. then sort of. Let's the show down by converting, <laughs> by abdicating and converting to Catholicism. So, it's a good question. <laughs> Charlie. I wonder if there are two different things you've noted between you at the beginning, nice big general ideas. And I was just wanted to try out whether there might be some sort of tension between them. I mean, one was this fact that for England, unlike France or America, we don't go back to the natural century, the 17th century, because yeah. they reach back for their revolutions as their sort of foundational myth, if you like, and we don't. So that was one of the thoughts. And the other thought was we'd all been too complacent through history with this weak view of history and thought Britain was great and so on. And I just wondered if there was sort of slight tension between these, because when people did bother about the 17th century, as I see it, they were really interested in the weak view of history. In other words, it was the yeah. 19th yeah. century mm. people and the historians mm that thought, well, that's the way we've got to do it. And so when you give up the sort of Whig account, then you lose the 17th century. I, I think if there's, that's a really strong point, I, but I think if, the, if, there's, if there's one aspect of the traditional Whig view, which uh, this and indeed other books, Linda Colley and others have, have focused on, is the notion that magically and brilliantly and with great wisdom, we managed to hop out of, um, authoritarianism of one kind or another into a parliamentary system without a war, without violence and without any problem, problem at all. And clearly I think this account uh, and, and recent other ones show that is absolute nonsense. And I again say I don't, I mean, I'm talking about England, but I just don't think you forget um, the 17th century in Ireland. I mean I think that becomes your go-to point. I, mean, I remember talking to Fergal Well I, I heard, I heard. <laughs> so I remember to, you know, talking to Fergal Keane and he was like, you know, you the only way I make sense of what goes on in Rwanda today or somewhere is to think about Ireland in 1641 or, you know, murals and things. Um, but I think you need to tell that story with the complexity rather than the sort of sometimes quite reductive simplicity of joining up sort of A, B and C and it all working out beautifully. Yeah. So we've uh, been discussing England during a particularly difficult period of its history and the discussion turns into a kind of lengthy shaggy dog sort in which an Irishman, a Welshman, <laughs> <laughs> walk into a room. Yeah. Um, can I just say thank you very, very much to Claire. It's an absolutely stonking well, book, a really, really important book, and it's been a great discussion. Thanks all very much indeed. Thank you very much.